Hello and welcome to the Rethinking Cyber podcast with me, Rebecca McLaughlin Easton, brought to you in association with the Global Cybersecurity Forum. In this third series, you'll hear my frank and thought-provoking conversations about the challenges and the opportunities shaping our cyber future. As I sit down with some of the world's greatest minds, eminent scientists, captains of the private sector and policymakers. Today, my special guest is Professor Richard Stainings, a cybersecurity lecturer at the University of Denver, focusing on postgraduate courses in cybersecurity and developing cybersecurity curricula for future workers in the healthcare sector. Richard is also the chief security strategist for Silera, a pioneer in the space of medical device and HIoT security. Richard, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for joining me in the GCF podcast studio today. Thank you for inviting me. You have worked in more than 30 countries for almost 30 years. Tell our audience more about your experience when it comes to cybersecurity leadership in the healthcare space. So I've been in the healthcare cybersecurity space for about the last 30 years. I guess that makes me a bit of a veteran to say, but I've, I've tended to focus either from an academic uh, perspective, um, teaching um, the next generation of cybersecurity professionals and, and healthcare leaders, or in terms of uh, working with startups and leading tech companies around the development of solutions that are actually going to be meaningful to the healthcare uh, industry. Tell me, why is healthcare such an historically popular target with cyber attackers? There's a number of concerns. One is the fact that we developed our healthcare systems with convenience in mind. So we have large, flat, open networks, right, to facilitate um, access to any system at any time by any clinician that may have calls to access that system. We haven't really designed in segmentation in the way that the banking industry has, for example. So if you're a teller in a bank, you have access to the one or two systems uh, that are available to you as a teller, and you don't have access to you know, the ledgers of the bank, to the futures trade or trading systems of the bank, because that's outside of your job remit. In hospitals or in the healthcare space in general, we tend to allow physicians to access any system in case there's a break glass moment, in case there's a need for them to do so. There's probably not uh, a very regular case for someone who works in paediatrics, for example, to uh, gain access to geriatric records, right? Uh, but we allow that um, and then we audit it after the fact to say, hey, you accessed a geriatric record as a paediatrician, uh, you know, can you explain why you did that, right? Um, and, that, and that's fine, right? Uh, we, we need to give physicians leeway. We don't want to put obstacles in the way of that, but we want to manage that a little bit better than we do today. So that is a huge concern. And secondly, I think that um, there has been a massive change, but the biggest change in the healthcare industry since the days of Florence Nightingale. Uh, and it's been going on for about the last decade and it's accelerating. And that is really the digitalization mm. of our healthcare services. We've moved from largely uh, manila folders and paper-based record systems um, on discrete medical applications and medical uh, systems to one of highly integrated, interoperable systems uh, that allows everything to be consolidated at the electronic patient record or the electronic medical record, depending on which terminology you use. And that has its own benefits in terms of driving efficiency, driving outcomes, but it introduces risks because of the expanded threat surface. How can healthcare providers, indeed government healthcare systems, really balance the need for integrating innovation and new technology into their organisations whilst mitigating risk, especially when it comes to AI? I think you, you used the correct word there. It's a, it's a question of balance, right? There are obviously conveniences uh, and drivers, efficiency drivers, um, in terms of the adoption of digital health services. Um, and that is greatly helping to improve uh, the efficiency of our delivery of those services, particularly at a time of scarce resources. Right? You never find a health system or a hospital system that has too much money. Right? Um, we've only got to look to, you know, to the NHS or to the US health system mm. to understand that even privately funded healthcare systems are, are, are short of cash. So it's a balance between the adoptability of, of technology and the risks that the adoption of that technology presents. The big concern in healthcare is one of what I call a maturity paradigm. Right? And that is where 
the adoption of new technology is outpacing our ability to secure that technology at the, at the present time, and that is leading to gaps in security. Our appetite for the adoption of AI applications and um, medical devices, for example, is, is enormous, right? Uh, but we're not investing, we're not building in cybersecurity in order to understand the risks that those systems, uh, those new systems are, are presenting to, uh, to the industry. So if we understand it correctly, healthcare providers the world over are not assessing their own risk accurately or indeed enough? Probably not. Um, so there, there are two factors there. One is from, uh, if I were to look at the medical device scenario, for example, medical devices are growing at 18% per annum compound, right? That's a, that's a huge clip. Um, a lot of these devices have uh, elaborate technologies that they're in, in being included in, in them. They're IoT based, so they're fairly dumb. They're not managed by hospital IT. Hospital IT manages the Windows workstations and servers in a hospital. These systems are managed by BMETs, by our biomedical technical engineers, right, or technicians. And uh, they are patched infrequently if patches are available. Um, they are not risk assessed. But most concerningly of all is that hospitals don't understand the number of the, the medical devices that attach to their networks with any degree of certainty. It's a manual process, so it's, it's a human entering information into a spreadsheet or a CMDB. It's not a, an automated process that validates information on an ongoing basis, nor, do, um, nor is that information updated as patches are applied or systems are, are made back to vendors and replaced with new systems, or, which may have a slightly different um, application stack and operating system on them. So we're not assessing the risks of those devices, and we're not prioritizing the remediation of those risks as we should do, uh, and as we do indeed um, for IT systems in our networks. So if healthcare providers don't know their inventory and hospitals don't have data on the number of medical devices connected to their network, let's say should a ransomware attack and inevitable tech failure take place, this puts patients in harm's way, in danger. And of course, that means lives are at risk. Is this problem quantifiable? Do we actually know how the numbers stack up? We don't right now. There are new regulations uh, that the European Commission has been looking at, obviously for the EU, um, and that uh, hopefully should begin to, to move the needle a little bit here, but we don't do a good job of understanding how many patients are impacted uh, from a patient morbidity or even mortality perspective. Is it a significant number? It's a very significant number. Okay. We know of two, there are two uh, death by ransomwares um, that are, have been reported in the press. One, uh, a woman who presented in uh, the University of Dusseldorf Hospital with a cardiac aneurysm and uh, her ambulance was redirected to a nearby hospital in Wuppertal, 30 minute drive away, um, as a result of a ransomware attack at the University of Dusseldorf. She um, died shortly after arriving in Wuppertal. Um, and the second is a, an infant born in a hospital in Alabama, um, and the mother presented um, at, the, uh, at the hospital to give birth, not knowing that the hospital was under ransomware attack and their fetal monitoring, fetal heart monitoring systems, their ultrasound systems and a number of other systems were unavailable um, to her and her uh, obstetric team to uh, aid with her birth. She gave birth to a daughter. Um, the daughter suffered uh, oxygen deprivation as a result of strangulation with the umbilical cord and uh, was born you know, pretty much uh, messed up, brain dead. She died six months later. Oh and uh, you know the, the parents are suing the hospital, but there are many more, perhaps as many, you know, in perhaps as much as hundreds of patients who have died as a result of these types of interruptions to the clinical systems that we now rely upon to treat patients. Where would you say the greatest weaknesses and vulnerabilities lie? In which specific clinical areas? Well, anything that directly touches a patient, right? We can obviously build in fallback solutions, um, you know, medical record, you know, standbys or printouts uh, of drug prescriptions, these sorts of things that patients may be on. But if we need to diagnose, monitor and manage a patient and those systems are taken down, then we lose our ability, we lose our visibility into the changing condition of that patient. So, for example, if you're in a hospital and you're being monitored, uh, by, uh, by telemetry, medical telemetry system, and that system goes down and you suffer an event, um, the nurse call center 
uh, nurse call stations won't be alerted to that change in your condition and uh, you are reliant on someone walking past the door to your room to understand that you're in trouble and need assistance. Um, you know, that's just one example of, of many scenarios, but ransomware in particular is, is heinous, right? It's really attacking the availability of our healthcare systems and that introduces clinical risk. Uh, two patients, uh, and obviously a huge concern. Two hospitals is very expensive, very disruptive, and um, you know needs to uh, needs to be protected against. In 2024, we saw a new government come to power in the United Kingdom, and it's well documented that the NHS, their national healthcare system, is creaking and groaning under the strain of too many people and not enough resources or indeed financing. 2025 could be pivotal for the NHS. Tell me why. We have been uh, building out a lot of digital interoperability between systems within trusts and within ICSs. Um, and we're also building out a federation uh, data exchange to allow patients uh, from Newcastle when they're um, on the beach in Torquay to be able to access their medical records, right? This sort of thing. Um, it's not it's not fully built out yet. We're also combining a lot of the disconnected medical devices in our hospital systems and putting them on the network now, which obviously helps to drive efficiency and instead of data having to be re-entered, um, is now providing um, direct data entry for that medical information into our electronic patient records. The more devices we add to our networks, the more risk is, is presented by that. So we need to ensure that as devices, as innovation is adopted, that we are, are building in adequate cybersecurity controls in order to protect patients and protect critical health IT systems. Adequate with a view to being robust. Indeed. <laughs> Professor, let me ask you, as we ask all our guests in the hot seat in the podcast studio, what are you most inspired by at this time in your field and what concerns you the most? I, I would say that there is a constantly changing landscape within healthcare, um, and that that technology landscape presents challenges to people like myself that are involved in securing the industry as a whole. We've seen a lot of development, a lot of innovation, and we're going to continue to see a lot of innovation, particularly around AI. Um, as we move more and more towards precision medication, for example, that is personalized medicine, right? We're not there yet unless you're extremely wealthy. That is really going to change the level of efficacy on drugs that are administered to us instead of you being subscribed a broad spectrum antibiotic, for example, with a, a low efficacy rate yeah. that you have to take for 30 days in order to, you know, to clear up whatever infection you've been um, prescribed the drugs for. We can get down to a single pill that cures your ailments, right? Um, but that is really reliant upon the development of AI algorithms, it's reliant upon um, huge lakes of data, medical data, that we can mine in order to build that AI um, and to build those precision medications. Um, and that requires massive amounts of, of cybersecurity to protect the data and also to protect the algorithm against things like data poisoning. Professor Richard Staining, sadly, we have to leave our conversation there, but it's been great to talk with you. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to seeing you at the annual meeting of GCF 2025. I look forward to coming too. It's been a pleasure. It just remains for me to also thank you, our global audience, for tuning in. Another podcast episode is coming very soon, so be sure to follow GCF on social media for updates. And I also look forward to welcoming you on the ground at the 2025 annual meeting of the Global Cybersecurity Forum in Riyadh. But for now, take care and goodbye. Yeah.